says our Mishnah on the bottom of 64b. Today's Daf Yomi is 65. Our Mishnah says, Amotze meis betchilo, that if you find the dead body in the ground and you're not sure, and you're not sure where, um, you're not sure if it was part of a cemetery. If it was part of a cemetery, you wouldn't be able to move it. But if it was part of a, just a buried there in passing, it says about cry, be able to move it because because we say that he wasn't intended to be buried there. So therefore, under these circumstances, that if you find this dead body there, Mushka Kedarko, if it's lying down in the manner in which a Jew is typically buried, which is on its back with his arms over his head, then no, then you're allowed to pick it up and move it as Tfusa. So you could also move the Tfusa. Tfusa is the earth associated with it. And the Gemara is going to define that exactly. Shnayim, if you find two dead bodies, no ton yes, tfusas, and you can pick them up, and also the tfus associated with them. Matzah Shlosha, if you find three dead bodies, miyesh bein zela zeh, midad amos vat shmon, if there is a space of four to eight amos, that was the way in which they would bury their grave, the, bury their dead in these crypts, that there would be one wall of four amos, the other wall of eight amos. So if you find them with the spacing of between four amos and eight amos, then we're going to assume that there was that it was part of this cemetery. So then we're going to say that it was part of this cemetery, and that you wouldn't be allowed to move it because then it was an indication that they were not buried there in passing. The only time you're allowed to move a grave if is if it was just buried there in passing. Then it really wasn't kona its place. It didn't acquire its place. Or else, or else the other way in which you can move it is if you're moving it to Kever Avos, the mission doesn't discuss this, if you're moving it to the grave of your ancestors, or if you're moving it to uh, Eretz Yisrael, which also is not discussed in our Mishnah. From that point, you check uh, from that point on 20 Amos. And so once you've established that there's a cemetery, you could check from there 20 Amos. You find a grave at the end of 20 Amos, you check from there another 20 Amos. Because it's, we can assume that if you had it, if found it initially, then we would say you can move the grave. But now that you've already established that there's a cemetery there, then you extend it 20 Amos. And, and every time you find another grave, you extend it another 20 Amos, assume it's part of the cemetery. So it says Rabbi Yehuda Matzah, if you found the dead body, Pratla Matzoi. It comes to exclude a case where it was, uh, where you knew it was there. If you had known it was already there, then we're going to say it wasn't buried in passing and these laws aren't going to apply. Mace, Pratla Harug, if it was found dead, but not if it was killed. If it was killed, we're going to assume that it's not whole. He was executed. And so then the law of Tefusa won't apply. You don't have to remove the, the earth with it. Mushkav, if it's lying down, pratal yoshev kadarko. Only if the dead body is found lying down, and not if it's sitting up. If it's sitting up, that's the way the non Jew is buried. Kadarko, pratal sharosho munach ben yarkosav. If he's buried in the normal way, to exclude a case where his head is between his thighs. Again, that's the way the Gentiles were buried, or the idolaters were buried. Tani ua barchanina meis shechaser. Let's say the dead body, and this supports the first clause that we said here in the name of Rabbi Yehuda. If you found the dead body missing part of their body, tfusa, then the law of Tfusa doesn't apply. You can move it without taking the Tfusa, the earth around it. But also we don't count it as part of the three bodies that are necessary to make a cemetery. The whole honey, my time alone. What's the reason why in all these cases, why my time alone, Reynon? Because maybe he's an idolater. The idolaters were very different than the Jews. And so if he's an idolater, you'd be allowed to move it. And also the law of Tfusa doesn't apply. It says the, Gemara, the Mishnah said that if you find two, you can move them. If you find three, you can't. It says the Gemara, says the Gemara, England Fusa, that if you find two, but the head of one is next to the legs of the other, then we assume it's from an idolater and they don't have the law of Tfusa. A Jew is always buried with his feet facing towards the gate of the cemetery, which is facing towards Jerusalem, so that he can get up 
uh, quickly for the resurrection of the dead. And so if you found one with the head to the legs, to the legs to the head of the other person, and then and then the other one with the legs to the head of the other one, meaning to say they're not all facing in the same direction, we can assume that it's that it, they're not, it's not the Jewish cemetery. Let's say you found three graves. One of them you had known, and two they were found, or two were no, or unknown, or maybe the Kirsa says that one was unknown. The love of Tfusa doesn't apply. To the to this, it's not considered a cemetery. Cemeteries for that one, or or we change the gears and say Yeshlam Tfusa. Even though it's not a cemetery, they have the love Tfusa the Elam Shkunas Kfaros, but it's not considered a cemetery because you need three to make this cemetery. One time, Rabbi Yeshiva was checking Matzah Shnayim, and he found two graves that were you doing that were known the Echad Tchila, one which was unknown, Ubikesh. He said he wanted to make it a cemetery, he wanted to declare it a cemetery. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva said to him, You've been working in vain. He said, We only say the law of, we really take out, here's gears to issues also. We only say the law of, of when it was when it was three. Um, three graves that we found that we didn't know about. Then we could call it a cemetery. So therefore, this is not a cemetery. There was only two known and one unknown. So it's not considered a cemetery. So you can move the bodies under those circumstances. So therefore, so so that's the halacha that Rabbi Yeshiva found them. So, and the basic halacha is that since in that case the three are not the same, there's a reclaim the duffer. They weren't buried in uh, that that case, the kfilas, but it was just intended to move them. So if the three don't have the same burials place, like the same level, we're not going to assume that they are ashunas kfaros. So it says the uh, Gemara, Echi Dama Tfusa, what's the case of Tfusa? I'm Rabbi Huda, I'm Rakra. Really, Echi Dami Tfusa doesn't mean what's the case of Tfusa, it means what's the source of Tfusa. So I'm Rabbi Huda, I'm Rakra, that it's based upon the fact that the verse says, Unisatani mi Mitzrayim, you shall lift me up from Egypt. What does that mean? You shall carry me, Jacob says, carry me up from Egypt. It means Totally me, take from, because you could just say when the satani, why does it say take me up from Egypt? It means totally me, take the earth with me coming up from Egypt. The Kama Shira Tfusa, and how much is the earth that you need to take up with you when you go up from Egypt? Pirish Rabbi Eliezer, and then the Girsa here is Rabbi Eliezer Ben Pidas. So Rabbi Eliezer Ben Pidas, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Pidas taught. Now, what is the shear of the tfusa? It is no to offer You take the earth that was already turned over, the bitsua, gimelatzbos, and you dig in the virgin earth that's next to it three fingers with and take that. And there are challenges that. Mesa, if it comes to short tfusa, we have a Bryce that says, What's the size of tfusa? The Lezabar of Tzadik said, No to us a kissmin. That what is the tfusa? You take the wood chips from the, from the coffin, that's a kisasos, and the clumps of earth. You remove the, the wood chips and you take the chips with you and you throw away the stuff uh, in, meaning to say you take the parts of the ark that, that for sure were not mixed in with the dead and you throw them away. But you leave behind when you move the earth the sveikos, the parts that were maybe mixed in, and the rest of the body that's the rest of the earth that's there can be combining the rov binyano shamais or rov atzamos or malitarv and rakev to make up the body. You have the either we had this several times in our tract, the majority of the bones, the majority of the frame, or the ladle full of corpse earth. But we see from here that if it's for sure not part of the uh, of the 
of the dead body, like the vadayim, you don't take it with you. So the pesuar shouldn't be taken with you. So, so it's a question of Rabbi Lezer ben Pedas, who says that you take with you uh, also the virgin earth. So the Torah says, "Who the Amar the high ki high time?" And Rabbi Lezer ben Pedas ruled like the following author: the Tanya we learned in the Brais of a Kama Shir. Excuse me. What's the size? Of, what's the amount of tefus? I'm Rabbi Yochanan Shimon Azai. No to offer tefuah for chofer bivsua shalosh etzbos. That you take the earth that was tilled over and you dig in the virgin earth three fingers. So Rabbi Lezer and Pedas holds like that position. So continuing along, Bode came menu. And you search 20 amos in every direction. So we're on top of 65b. I'm a rabba, bodek, ufina, badak, ufina, badak, v'eshkach. So let's say what happened was you searched the first time, you found one grave, and you moved it because you only found one. And then another, then you searched some more. In your courtyard, you found the second one, and you moved it. And now badak, v'eshkach, and now you found the third one. Then lo hai mafnu gabe anach tray. Well, now you can't. Now we have this third grave. Then you're not allowed to move the third one next to the first two because we're. It's now established that this third body that you found was certainly a shlunas kvaro, so it was a cemetery. So you can't move it to the other two. Or hani tray and gabe ai, and you can't gabe ai chad, and you can't move the other two back to the first one. Uh, because when you moved them, you didn't know, you didn't know that there was a cemetery and he was allowed to move them, but now you can't move them back. That's what Rava says. The alternate version of this is No, since you had gotten permission when you moved them and you didn't know that there was a third grave, now you can move them also the third one, because now. It's lying there by itself, and the shlumas kvaros is only when it's one grave, not three. So now you can move it back. You can move this third one as well. So Amar Shlakish, Shlumar says, Shvinu kishlumas shlumas kvaros. Why don't we say that it's like a cemetery? And why is he allowed to move this third one? It's now established that there were three graves within this space, and so why should he be allowed to move the third one? So Rish so Shlakish says, very powerful phrase. Because they found the pretext, excuse me, to purify the land of Israel. They didn't want the land of Israel becoming a cemetery. So they found the pretext to allow you to move it. What's the pretext? Well, you've already moved the first two before it was established like a graveyard. Since they've already moved it, therefore, therefore, you're going to be allowed to do this. So, so therefore, since they already moved it, it was a pretext to allow you to move the land of Israel. <clears throat> we see from here that the overwhelming factor here is that they want to make the land of Israel pure, even though it's talking about all this tumma and graveyards. We don't want graveyards. We don't want, you know, we're very careful about the laws of purity, but at a baseline, we want to, we want to recognize that it's about purity and especially the land of Israel. We need to move forward. We, we need to be pro-development, as they say. Let's say you search another 20 hours, you didn't find anything. So what will be the law? So what? It doesn't matter. He says, He says, do we say, do we say if you search 20 hours and you don't find anything, do we say that it was those three dead bodies that you found were not part of the cemetery? So we say, no, once you have the three bodies together, we're going to say it's a shlunas kvaros, it's still a cemetery, you can't move it. Now we're on to the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, again, we're just talking about the case of Magayim Odava. Our Mishnah says, Kol Safik Nagayim with Fiwa Tahor. So any case where you have a doubt whether or not it was Saras or not, if the person had not yet been established as Saras, we're going to be lenient. Before they become Tameh. And once they've been established as Tameh, then Sveko Tameh. Now we're going to say as a doubt or Tamei. The Mishnah Nagayim talks about a case where there were two people who came before the coin at the same time. And the coin gave a ruling. One of them had this, uh, uh, a mark. They both had marks which you, which you had to send them away for quarantine. And, you, and the coin forgot the size of each one. One of them was smaller than the other, the size. And then this, or, or some, 
It could be also there's a dispute in the mission there whether it's one person with two different marks and the smaller size, and then they became equal. And we're not sure whether or not it was the one who had the smaller size it grew, or and so therefore you're not sure if the saras had spread and then they're tummy or not. So if they had not become tame yet, we're going to say it's tahor. But if they had already been tame, then we're going to say. It's Safek Tumah, it's a doubt about Tumah, we're going to say he's Tame. Anyway, the Gemara says, what's the source for this idea that a Safek Negayim is if Pitfiwa is Tar, that if we're not sure at the beginning he's Tar, tar. so the Gemara says, what's the source for this idea? It's based upon the fact that the verse states, it's based upon the fact that the verse states, Vitaro O Tamo to make him pure, you go to the Kohen to make him pure Tahor or Tameh. So because the Pasuk starts with the word Tahor at first, therefore we're going to say Suffolk Tumah by Tsaras, we're going to be lenient. The, the verse starts with Tahara first, a very powerful idea. The, the, and this relates also to this idea, our presumption is we want to go towards Tahara towards purity. And the Gemara says, well, if that's the case, well, if that's the case, even if he had already become Tame at the beginning, we should also say that the outset, or if it's a doubt, we should say it's Tahar. So we say if Rav Yehuda Marav taught this teaching, he taught about the following. Now, we have a thing that if there's a white mark, in Baharas, Sayar, if there's a, a Baharas is a mark, a white mark, and, and if there's two white hairs in it, so if the Baharas came before the hairs, and if the Baharas came before the white hairs, we're going to say he's Tameh. And if the white, the two white hairs on the body came before the Baharas, we'll say that he's Tahor, but Safek, Tameh. But if we're not sure, then we're going to say he is Tame. Whereas Rabbi Yeshua says Kia. Rabbi Yeshua says the word Kia. What is the word? Kia means it's faded. My Kia. I'm Rabbi Yehuda, Kia Vitar. Rabbi Yehuda says it means Kia and he's Tahor. And Vidilma um, Kia Vitame. Maybe he's Kia and he's Tame. So the Gemara explains. But because of Pasuk uh, starts with the word Tara first, we're going to say, if, if it fades, we're going to say that it's a doubt, and therefore he is uh, he is Tahor. Gemara elsewhere has a dispute, and the Gemara says that Hashem himself got involved and rules Tahor. But the Rambam says, in this case of a doubt, the Rambam Paskins against Hashem, which is a big discussion. <laughs> How can the Rambam Paskin against Hashem, but the Rambam rules it's Tamei. So now we go on. The last Mishnah of this stuff tells us that in seven ways, you're able that if there's a Zav, a Zav is a person who had several uh, missions, two or three emissions, a man, <coughs> but they're not seed. It, it looks like seed. It's sometimes hard to distinguish, but it's, a, it's like a pus that comes out of his body. And if he has it over a period of between one to three days, we're going to say that he is Tamei and he has to count seven clean days. And, and depending if he has three uh, emissions, he's going to have to also bring a carbon and immerse in Mayim Chayim. So, but if he had a reason and ones that was extenuating circumstances, then we're going to say that, he, that he's not Tamei as a Zav. So, B'Shiva Drachem Bodkin as a Zav. So there are seven basically ways we could check the Zav to see if, why he had the emission, and then he wouldn't be a Zav. But this is only prior to him becoming a Zav. Once he had been established as a Zav, we don't use these ones, these extenuating circumstances. What are they? Bimacha, maybe he ate something. Bimishta, maybe he drank something. Bimasa, maybe he carried something. Bimfitza, maybe he used his uh, exercise. Bifoli, maybe he was sick. What is Mara? Mara means maybe he saw something that, that he he was um, maybe he saw Tosa says he saw a woman and that's what caused him to uh, uh, to see it. Um, it's not it's not the only interpretation of the Mara, but that's what Tosa says. And Ubihir her. 
and maybe he had thoughts. He had thoughts about a specific, uh, a specific person, a specific woman. Mishanistakoziva, once he's become established as a Zav, in both can also. Now we no longer uh, rely upon these methods. Uh, in both can also own so. This fake, uh, and so then we no longer rely upon these things once he, um, once he, uh, once he's had already been, once he's already been a, uh, a, a Zav. Usveiko, and we also, if he has a Safek, the Sheikh Vasera to Mayim. And so once he's already been established as a Zav, if he has a Safek, whether or not he's a Zav or not, or whether or not he has the male seed, then we're going to say all these cases are going to be za, like the law of a Zav. Meaning if he has the male seed, once he's already uh, ha, become a Zav, we're going to rule that it's more, it's like a Zav. And the reason is Raglaya Modavar. We're, we're going to say that there is Raglaya Modavar. Like we said before, there's less to the matter and it's really coming from the type of flow that's called the Zav flow. Because since he already saw two Re'iyos and he became established as a Zav, then we're going to say that all the other things that came out are coming out as a result of his Ziva and not from other reasons. And then we just finished the Mishnah, Amakas Chavero. Let's say a person strikes his friend, Rahman al-Salam Misa, they establish that he's going to die. Ve'ikal, and then he got better, Mima Shahaya. Uh, he got better, he seemed to recover, and but then he got sicker again, and mace, then we're going to say he's chayef, he's, he's liable for, for death, for having killed him. Rabbi Nechemi Omer Pater, Rabbi Nechemi says we're going to say he's exempt, because we're going to say the assumption is that he was, the assumption is that, that he was the, that he had gotten better. So the Gemara asks the question, Minani Mili, what's the source? That, that after he becomes a Zav from his second sighting, he's going to be liable for a carbon on the third sighting, even if we could say that there was extenuating circumstances, there was an onus. So I'm Rav Nassim, I'm Rav Zav as Zavo. It says in the Pasuk, a person has his flow for a male or a female. The Chum say that since the Pasuk says the word Zav twice, meaning to say, and afterwards it writes for a male or a female, then we're going to learn a comparison that we're going to say then we're going to say under those circumstances the the for the third sighting we're going to compare it to a woman just like by a woman we don't care about extenuating circumstances that cause her to flow meaning to say you can't say well the woman is having the flow because uh, um, uh, she ate something we're still going to judge her as a zava so to the man once he gets to the third sighting we're going to say it doesn't matter if it was an onus Mara says is that really the case that even for the third one we check him if it was an onus or not but by the fourth one we don't check him so the Gemara says okay they're arguing about the word s so, so meaning to say, even Rabbi Eliezer says we compare male to a female, but the Chachamim are arguing about by which point we compare him to, we compare him. That according to Rabbi Eliezer, we say, we expound the word S, the Hazav S Zovo. And it's as though it's written the word Zav three times. Zav et Zovo. It's as though it's written three times. And only afterwards can we compare male to the female and say we don't care about Ones. Whereas the Chacham say we don't darsh in the word S. And so therefore they are of the position that already by the third time we compare the male to the female. And so therefore he's not going to be a, he's not going to re- uh, require a carbon when he sees it uh, um, accidentally. Okay, so we'll stop over here for today. A big shkoyach to everybody.